Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. My name is Bob Hansen, and I'm the director of the Emerson Center for Leadership and Service. As many of you know, that the Emerson Center has combined with the Center for Engaging the World and with the National Churchill Museum to form a new entity called the Churchill Institute. I'm asking you now to take a few seconds to turn off your, your uh, cell phones, your pagers, anything electronic. And I also would like to remind you to please stay in the hall until the very final closing is given by Dr. Havers, out of respect for our speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Antoine Rudiasiri, who is a national leader in Rwanda. I first met Antoine in 2007 when I was traveling in uh, Eastern Africa on behalf of Humanity for Children, a humanitarian group that many of you are familiar with. It was in Rwanda that I first heard of a man known only as Antoine. It seemed that everyone knew Antoine, or at least knew of him. He seemed to have a name a little bit like Pele, where uh, no last name was needed. And of course, I was eager and intrigued, and I couldn't wait to meet this man. And accidentally, I met him at the very end of my first trip there. And I was eager because his name was associated always with respect and reverence and great pride. I heard him called the Desmond Tutu of Rwanda. I heard him called the voice of the common man the voice of reason. But the word I heard most often associated with Antoine is the word peacemaker. Antoine is a national leader in Rwanda and a force in the post-genocide reconciliation movement. He is a genocide survivor. He's also an Anglican priest who recently was appointed to head the college uh, and a, a theological seminary in Kigali. He has spoken across the globe on issues surrounding the genocide and reconciliation, and he is a noted author. His latest book is called Faith Under Fire. Something a little more personal, he is the husband of Panina, who is also involved in the reconciliation movement, the father of four children, but he and Panina have really a much larger family, because after the genocide, they opened up their home to all those children who uh, didn't have a family, had no loved ones to go back to, so he has a much larger family than that. I want to remind you that Antoine is leading a discussion tomorrow at 10.15. Uh, it's a breakout session, and I encourage you to join him then if you're interested in this topic where you can talk more intimately about the Rwanda genocide and reconciliation. I am so glad that Antoine accepted our invitation to speak at this symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Antoine Rudiaseri. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great joy for me to be here, and uh, I want to thank Bob for the introduction. Uh, when I'm in Rwanda, sometimes people say, oh, uh, we thought Antoine is a, a big, tall man, then there's somebody of uh, kind of a small dimension, like myself. But um, it's always a great joy to speak about reconciliation and peace. And today I want to, the topic that has been given to me is to speak about the genesis of the genocide of Rwanda of 1994 against the Tutsis. And I decided to start by <clears throat> a personal story. Oh, well, when this if they tell you that a murderer has been released in the neighborhood, how would you feel? And this time we weren't releasing one, we were releasing 40,000. 
you consider a million people who got destroyed? At the hands of their neighbors. When you get one million people dead, it becomes impossible to exert justice. The president of Rwanda passed a decision to release the perpetrators who had confessed their role in genocide. So far, 50,000 have been released. Why on earth should a survivor of the genocide in Rwanda forgive somebody who murdered either their mother or husband or brother or sister? Somebody has to tell them this painful message of forgiveness. If we let them be consumed by that ongoing bitterness and anger, it's like an acidic content in a metro container. It will eventually eat the container up. When they forgive, they get released. We have rebuilt the roads, we have rebuilt the schools, We've rebuilt the hospitals, are rebuilding the hearts of people remain a big challenge. Are you crazy? Reconciliation? The one who killed your family. How do I reconcile with someone who killed my family? Forgiveness is not human, it's divine. As this clip is taken from a documentary entitled As You Forgive, so if you are interested, you could uh, probably get it from uh, Laura. She's American. She was a student when she made this. So this was just an introduction about the genocide in Rwanda. And uh, as I told you, I'd like to start by a personal story. Uh, first of all, this map shows you where Rwanda is. For those who don't know, Rwanda is in the central part of Africa. Often it is called the heart of Africa. But it's a very small country. I remember when I went to study in uh, Bangor, North Wales in 1986, when I was in London at Heathrow, the custom officer, the immigration officer asked me, where do you come from, young man? I said, I come from Rwanda. And he said, where? I said, Rwanda. And he said, uh, in which country? I say the country is Rwanda. Say no way, because I've never heard of such a country. So Rwanda wasn't well known until the genocide of 1994, because as you can see, when we travel outside Rwanda, we call it the dot in the heart of Africa, because it's a very small country, 10,000 uh, square miles, but with a large population of today, we are 10 million and some extra. So it's the most densely populated country in the heart of Africa, squeezed between Uganda and Burundi and Tanzania and uh, the large Congo on the western part of the country. So that's where Rwanda is. And uh, I was born in Rwanda. I grew up in Rwanda. I've always lived in Rwanda, and hopefully I, I'll die in Rwanda, because that's my dream. But all the troubles and uh, tribulations that the Rwandan people have lived through, I lived through. And that's why I often tell people, um, I'd like to die in Rwanda, but after seeing change. Because sometimes in your life, when you grow up in a very tough, difficult situation, you get to a point where you have to make up your mind. Either you become negative, bitter, and destructive, or you simply decide to become positive and constructive. And uh, that's what I decided. Because when I was five, I saw my father killed in the first wave of massacres against the Tutsis. And I grew up hating the Hutus. 
by the way, just to understand what I'm talking about, Rwanda is, and I'm going to explain that a bit, a bit later, Rwanda is populated by three groups, the Hutus, who form the majority, and you will understand why, and the Tutsis, and a small group that very often they don't speak about the Twa. So I come from the Tutsi group, which is in between. And uh, my father was killed during that time when the first wave of massacres against the Tutsis happened, and that was between 1959 and 1963. So my father was killed just towards the end of the first wave of massacres. And I grew up hating the Hutus. When I was 15, I was in secondary school. What we, I think here you call it high school. I don't know how you, uh, your systems uh, work with our system. And we were again kicked out of school. And my mind was made that Hutus are bad from the time they are, they are young. Because I was telling myself maybe they killed my father because he had done something against them. But for me, I hadn't done anything against them. So I said, these people are bad from the core. And when I was 25, you can count 5, 15, 25, I was teaching at the university as an assistant lecturer. Then our government came up with a new policy on ethnic distribution of jobs. And I was fired from my job. And when I asked why, they said, well, you've had your time. And I said, but I've never had my time. My time is now. So they said, it's a government policy. You have to go. So I went, and uh, I was redeployed in a secondary school because by then, everybody who had benefited from government scholarship didn't have the right to choose which job to take. You took the job that was given by the government. So I was redeployed in a countryside secondary school where I taught for eight years. And it was during that time that uh, I started reading the Bible. And then I got converted. And I got convicted that I had to change and love my enemies. Actually, Sometimes when I tell people that uh, many Christians live in a contradiction, they don't understand because wherever I go, I find people who are bitter, full of hatred, full of anger, full of bitterness, but God calls us to love and even love our enemies. And that's what changed my life. And after that transformation, I decided that the whole country should change. And I started telling people that the only way to build a better future for our nation was to love, to forgive, to repent, and to reconcile. So that's how I ended up in the Unity and Reconciliation Commission. And uh, that's how I became a pastor. So now going back to my topic of the genesis of gen genocide. Actually, for many of you, uh, as students, probably the genocide doesn't mean much because that's 16 years ago. And most of you probably were young and uh, haven't even heard about it, I'm sure. But the genocide was one of those human-made, man-made tragedies because in 100 days, more than a million Tutsis were massacred. That's an average of 10,000 people being killed every day. But that wasn't the end of it because 3 million of our people became refugees and displaced. More than 500,000 children in the country were left orphaned. More than 60,000 women were widowed. All the infrastructures, the schools, the hospitals, private properties were looted and destroyed. And worse than that, we were left divided, full of anger, full of bitterness, full of hopelessness. You, you, you name any kind of negative emotion, you could find it in Rwanda. And that's the country that has been given to us to rebuild and to repair. 
So what are the factors that led to that genocide? You know, for those who love simplic simplifications, they will tell you that the Hutus hated the Tutsis so much that they decided to wipe them out. That's wrong. Actually, I've always been a defender of the Hutus because I had many friends among them, although I hated them at the beginning. Because the genocide of Rwanda wasn't the result of just hatred. It was the result of a compounded mixture of factors. One of those is our historical uh, relationships. Because as I told you, Rwanda from a time immemorial was populated by three ethnic groups. We had the Hutus, the Tutsis, and the Toa. And actually, these were more of social classes than ethnic groups. Because when you go into our history, it was possible to shift from being a Hutu if you became wealthy and married among the aristocrats, Tutsis, you easily became a Tutsi. And a Tutsi who became poor could easily slip down and become a Hutu. Actually, Kezat Point is my family because when I trace my ancestry, on the seventh generation, I hit a king. So my ancestor on the seventh generation was a king. But my father was a businessman. He wasn't even in the politics. And if anything, my grandfather was among the poor, and my grand-grandfather had married among the Hutus because he had been dispossessed. So that's the, this was a kind of socially mobile type of social structure. But during the colonial times, uh, and that started in 1900. Uh, the Belgians and the Germans, when they came in, they tried to sort out who was Hutu and who was Tutsi. Actually, all the time I hear people saying, how do you know who is Hutu and who is Tutsi? Physically, you can't tell. Because of the intermarriages and uh, color of the skin doesn't serve much, we speak the same language, we have the same culture, we live in the same villages. We go to the same schools, we go to the same churches. So physically, you can't tell who is who. But during that time, they put in place a system that made it very easy to know who was who. Because they put our identity, ethnic identity, in our papers. So during the genocide, it was very easy. They would say, your identity card, sir. You take it out, you are dead or alive. It was as simple as that, because the identity card was the demarcation that made it easy for the genocide to happen. Without that, the genocide wouldn't have happened to the level it did. And then secondly, because Rwanda is a very small country, it was very easy to know who is who. Actually, you know your neighbor and you know people along the village. So it was very easy to know who comes from the Tutsi and who comes from the Hutus. But what is it that created that kind of animosity? First of all, we had a Tutsi monarchy. And monarchies are always a monopoly of power in the hands of one group. So the Hutus, who were the ordinary people, simply resented that monopoly of power at some point. And during the colonial times, the Belgians made it worse because while the Hutus could climb the ladder previously, now it became more complicated because all the powers, all the seats, were reserved exclusively for the sons of the chiefs. So that complicated things again. And then another thing that happened during that time, the Belgians came with very repressive systems. But because the repressive systems were implemented by the Tutsi chiefs, all the blame went on the Tutsis. There were lots of beatings and defining and imprisoning and other things. And the Hutus started saying, these Tutsis are cruel. So that complicated things. And then when you go to the time of independences in the 50s, that's when most of the countries in Africa and Asia and other places started claiming for independence. The Belgians turned the Hutus against the Tutsis. 
what we call divide and rule. They supported the Hutus against the Tutsis, and that's when the first wave of massacres started. So what can we learn from that? I often tell people, for those who are building peace, the first thing you need to do is to look into the history of the nation and look for the wounds of the past. Because bad relationships of the past very often will, op will operate as landmines planted on the road to the future. I will give you an example. In 1993, when the genocide was being prepared, I spoke to the son of, or to one of the sons of my neighbor, who was a militia leader, and I said, why do you hate the Tutsis so much? You listen well what he told me. He said, my father told me what they did to his father. So that son had never known a Tutsi regime, but his father hadn't known a Tutsi regime, but he said, my father told me what they did to my grandfather. So that son was carrying the hatred transmitted to him from his grandfather. And very often, those animosities of the past are what would destroy the future. And for those who are engaged in peace building, those are some of the things we need to look into. Because the systems that have been built and the relationships that have gone bad are a preparation for calamity in the future. And 1959, when uh, the Belgians supported the Hutus and they got the power, then they engaged in what I call politics of retaliation. Because a large number of the Tutsis who left the country weren't allowed to come back. So they formed refugee camps around the country. By the way, in some other countries, if you see a large number of refugees living on the borders of the country they've left, then again, you know that's a recipe for a future calamity. Because those refugees stayed there, the second generation, made up of most of the leaders we have today, those who left when they were boys and girls, small boys, when they grew up, they were tired of being refugees near their own country. So they organized themselves into an army, and in 1990, they attacked the country. And that sparked off the wave of propaganda that led to the genocide. And for us, who had said, stayed inside the country, in that politics of retaliation, we were not allowed to have access to influential positions. That's why, for instance, teaching at the university was an influential position, and they decided that I shouldn't be staying there. And that had been called ethnic equilibrium. Usually, when people put in place ethnic quotas, it's to defend minorities from being oppressed by majorities. But when you put in place a law to defend a majority against a minority, that becomes oppression. And actually, sometimes people don't see that's the kind of unjust situation we had in Rwanda. But I call that politics of retaliation. Wounded leaders will always practice that kind of leadership. Actually, that's what very often people don't see. If you put in a place a wounded leader, very often he will use his power to retaliate on the people who belong to the group that offended his group. And that will help you sometimes to understand some of the problems we have. Uh, let me go a bit faster. So, when the Tutsis who were outside the country grouped themselves into the group that was called the RPF or the Rwanda Patriotic Front, attacked the country, then here you find some of the topics we are discussing here. They started using the media for propaganda, and they started this kind of disseminating hate propaganda saying that it is self-defense. So they were saying, Hutus, stand up and defend yourselves against the attack of the Tutsis. And the Tutsis who were inside the country became like a victims, but they became like a tool of blackmail against the, the Tutsis who were attacking from outside. 
Then finally, in 1994, the decision was taken that the only way to curb and stop the advance of the RPF was to kill every Tutsi from the children up to the old people and that not a single Tutsi would remain alive. So in 100 days, more than 1 million Tutsis were massacred. But the RPF finally won the war and stopped the genocide. But that came with some other consequences because a war will come with uh, refugees and uh, destruction and uh, animosities. But I'm going to leave that for the time of questions. So there are some other factors that influenced the genesis of the genocide. One of those, as I told you, Rwanda is a very small country and it is highly populated. When you have nine million people on a small space of 10,000 square miles, again, that's a big problem, mainly when it's a government, when it's a nation living on agriculture. So killing your neighbor became very easy because it was an opportunity to expand your land. And actually in the hate propaganda, that was used as a tool of conviction. Number two, Rwanda is a very poor country. Even until today, although we've made some progress, we are still among the bottom 15 poorest nations of the world. In a poor nation, it's very easy to instigate violence. Then number three, we have a low level of education. Actually, by 1994, when the genocide happened, 52% of our population couldn't read and write. So ignorance is a very fertile land for hatred, manipulation, and violence. So for those who want to build peace, sometimes you have to look at a holistic approach to the problem, not just solving one piece of the puzzle, but looking at the problem in a kind of holistic way. Now, this is my conclusion, and I think I'm going to leave the second part of healing the land for my talk tomorrow. Some of the factors that make a fertile terrain for conflict and violence unhealed wounds of the past. Space congestion and poverty, ignorance and illiteracy, and poor leadership and manipulative politicians. And very often, if you are going to build peace, you have to go back and look into all those details, and then you start working from there. Today, we have managed to build a certain level. Actually, I want to leave the rest of the time for your questions, because I prefer when people ask questions and then you answer and you have some interaction. We have managed to put together measures to build peace by scrapping down some of the rules and laws that divided us. We have managed to rebuild the infrastructures. We have put in place some of the systems that allow for healing and reconciliation, but, still, but we still have a long way to go. Because healing a nation, as I've seen it, doesn't take just a few years. And that's what people don't understand. Because our generation, in the generation of our parents, for me, they are wounded beyond total healing. Even when they are healed, they remain with the scars. Our children are inheriting some of the wounds we carry today because the parents speak to their children and they transmit to them some of the emotions and uh, negative sentiments. So we hope that the third generation our grandchildren probably will live in a better nation. So I think I'm going to stop here and allow you to ask questions because I know uh, it will take longer to speak about the second part of my topic. And then I'm going to answer the questions. And probably if you need to know, you ask the questions from there. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we have
have plenty of time for questions, so please form an orderly line at one of these two microphones. And feel free to ask any question. I know sometimes people say, oh, you only, when you come from Rwanda, you don't answer every question, but I think feel free to ask, to ask any question you have on your mind. Thank you. Well, my name is Gregory Roxon. I'm a junior at Westminster College. Um, whenever I look back at Rwanda and I look at the achievements, I'm sort of amazed by the level of progress that has been made mm -hmm. in terms of a booming economy and a great healthcare system. But then there have been many people who have accused President Paul Kagame of using the genocide as an excuse to suppress civil rights and liberties. And quite recently, the, um, a UN report uh, reported that the Rwandan army is um, committing acts of genocide against Hutus in Congo. As someone who holds an influential position in, in Rwanda, I would like to know your thoughts on these issues and also sort of applying your experience to a more recent form of genocide, what's going on in Darfur. We quite know that on January 9th, Sudan will be going to the polls to decide whether it wants to stick together as one nation or to separate us into the North in Sudan and Southern Sudan. Um, mm -hmm. and it's been called a second time bomb because people are afraid there might be a second war if care is not taken. Um, if you had one message for President Obama, um, what would you tell him to do in relation to um, Sudan? And let's okay, thank you. Um, that's a very good question because actually many people have been uh, saying, you know, Rwanda, uh, from the time I got here, people have been saying, you know, Rwanda is uh, very restrictive on uh, human rights and very restrictive on uh, freedom of speech and so on. I often tell people that's an American way of judging a situation. And I do understand why, because you see, and uh, I have to confess that I'm part of the people. It, it wasn't Paul Kagame who did it. Most of those restrictive laws actually were asked or requested by the commission I belong to. Because when you want to heal a nation that has been broken by ideology, the first thing you do is to control ideology. You control speech. Because there are things that are allowed and there are things that are not allowed to speak about in Rwanda. Actually, by the way, if you want to find a good example, you look at Germany after World War II. Anybody who engaged in a negationism of the genocide against the Jews, anybody who engaged in a revisionism against the genocide was punished by law. So for us, rebuilding a nation, and for us, it, it's not even something outside our context. The genocide was committed by Rwandese against Rwandese. And what we are trying to do, if I could go back to that um, clip, we are living with survivors of the genocide who are angry. And we are living with those who committed the genocide who have to live next to them. If you allow people just to talk the way they want to talk, then you can't manage the future. So we had to restrict. Actually, I'm a part of the commission that asked the government to put in place restrictive laws on some freedoms of speech. You don't just go around saying, Hutus, stand up, let's go against the Tutsis. You can't. Some of the candidates you are talking about during the elections, the lady came from Holland, she comes, she's campaigning on a Hutu identity. We say, no, you can't. So some of the things people blame are compulsory when you are repairing a broken nation. I often use the image of a broken leg. When you have a broken leg, you don't go out playing soccer or football. You put it in a cast, you constrain it, you limit it, you immobilize it until it is healed. And I'm sure once our country is healed, we are going to get rid of some of those restrictive measures. But for the time being, when you are still managing some of the problems, we can't. So Paul Kagame is innocent in that. It's not that he happens to be president of a broken nation, but if anything, I don't think he should be blamed for it. All of us, we should be blamed for it because some of the measures, some of the laws that are put in place, it's not on his instigation. And I have to bear uh, the condemnation, if there is any, that our commission actually was the one who asked for 
the law against divisionism, and that limits some freedoms of speech. And another commission fighting against the genocide came up with another law, and that was promulgated. So some of those laws, they are simply put in place for a clear reason. Once our country is healed, then we are going to go for freedom of speech, any kind of speech. There one American came to Rwanda and uh, had been airing some revisionist ideas and what he was put in jail. And people said, you can't put an American in jail. But for sure enough, he's, if he's breaking some laws in Rwanda, he's going to be punished for it. So I think for that one, the problem is not with Paul Kagame, the problem is with the nation he's leading. Uh, the case in Congo, actually the report that was written about the Rwandan army. By the way, it wasn't just about the Rwandan army. It was about all the armies that went into Congo. But it became a problem for Rwanda because they said the Tutsi army or the RPF army committed genocide. And they were saying, sure enough, the genocide that happened in Rwanda wasn't committed by the RPF. So this is a misinterpretation of facts. But the thing is, when you read what the commission had written, it wasn't even affirmative. They were saying if a judge will look into this, he might decide the, what they did was a genocide because it was done by Tutsis against Hutus. So it's, it's, a, it's a bone of contention that's there. So I'm not going to talk much about it. It's still under debate. But sure enough, it raised a lot of emotion in the country. And actually, Rwanda threatened to walk out of every UN uh, initiative from Darfur and so on and so on. But uh, I hope it's, not, it's going to end up well. Uh, they are discussing it politically, so we are going to see. Sudan, Darfur, uh, to be honest with you, one of my disappointments with the world, uh, Darfur would be one of those cases. Because from 1945, after the Holocaust, the UN decided that never again, no more genocide. But genocides are happening all over, and uh, no measures are taken to stop them because of the sovereignty of nations and so on. So it's a, it's a problem, I don't think. And when you ask me if I have a message for Obama, I don't think I have any. <laughs> because that would be presumptuous on me to say that I have a solution for Darfur. Because most of the things that are done, and that's what I regret, stupidities done by leaders against their own people shouldn't be blamed on other leaders. Because I don't think Obama should be blamed for what's happening in Darfur. That's a Sudanese stupidity. And it should be blamed on the Sudanese than on other leaders. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. My, my name is Bernardo Vimpi. I'm a senior. Uh, you did talk about the, the three, three million refugees. So I want to know what are the policies that the government is implementing in order to bring those refugees back to, to Rwanda and help rebuild the country. Thank you. Oh, that one is a finished question because those refugees stayed on the border with Congo until 1996. We had something like uh, 2 million in Congo, 500 in Burundi, and a few three or 400,000 in Tanzania. They've all, they've all come back except a few. We still have something like 60,000 or more around that. Some of them went down south, in, uh, some are in Mozambique, others are in Angola, Malawi. So we still have some, but they are not, uh, and a few in Congo. So those have been repatriated. Unfortunately, by war. So when you, when you hear of the war that happened in Congo, it was a fault while repatriating those refugees. So it's very unfortunate, but uh, it happened. Um, I'm wondering, um, you talk about forgiveness and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what sort of process that actually entails, if it's from you know, a top-down policy with the overhead national government, or if it's more of a community involvement type situation. Just wondering what it actually looks like. Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, for those who want to go deeper on that, <clears throat> you attend the, um, the talk tomorrow. Because I didn't want to go deep in the issue of reconciliation because it will take time. But it's one of those areas where we are concentrating a lot of energy. 
at the level of the government, because if you are going to operate reconciliation, you have to, again, you have to look in a holistic manner, looking at the needs of the population, the physical needs. You have to look at the level of security in the country. You have to look at the sentiments, the emotions, helping the emotions to heal. So those who committed the crimes coming to themselves and uh, confessing and asking for forgiveness, and those who have been offended being helped to heal and then forgiving and then bringing them together. And then the issue of justice, because we couldn't operate with a kind of formal justice. We opted for the restorative justice we used to use in the time of our ancestors with the Gachacha courts. So we have released most of the prisoners and they are going back into the community. But operating the reconciliation is a long process because uh, forgiveness is not the only issue in the process of reconciliation because you forgive somebody who has asked for forgiveness. So helping the offenders to confess and repent and change and helping the offended to heal and forgive, that's what we are working at. But on the other hand, you have to work at the laws, giving equal opportunities to everybody, and then also changing the values in the country. Because sometimes when you see a country going into destruction, the first thing that gets destroyed is their positive values, their cultural values. Just to give you an example, during the genocide, the population had to be forced to kill women and children. Because in 1959, 60, 61, during the first wave of massacres, our culture was made so that it was a taboo to kill a woman or a child, even in a time of war. But during the genocide, they had to use propaganda to convince people that this time we don't spare even the children and the women. So we are trying to rebuild some of the values that have been lost. So it's a long process, combined effort, physical needs, alleviating poverty, as he was saying, uh, security, tightening the security. If you come to Kigali or to Rwanda, you are going to see that the security in Rwanda is very tightened. Actually, it's one of the safest places you can be in the world because security for us is very important. But the level, the third level, making people accept and love each other and live next to each other, trusting each other, that's going to take us a long time. Because healing the hearts of people is the most difficult in the process of reconciliation. Thank you, sir. Um, my name is James Perry, and uh, I'm a junior here at Point Semester College. Mm -hmm. And uh, you touched on the aspect of tribalism, and which I think is one of the main issues which the African continent faces. And uh, I would just like to know how do we rise above uh, tribalistic tendencies, you know, to, to be grouped in one side? And the second question is, uh, can you address the issue of uh, Forgiveness, is it just, does it just help uh, victims or does it also help uh, perpetrators of the genocide? Good Thank question. Uh, how do we rise above tribalism? Actually, that's one of the most unfortunate things in Africa because our politics, our relationships are not governed by national interest. Very often they are governed by our tribal interests. And that's a big problem because our nations are divided. I often tell people, if Africa hadn't been a tribal, and our leaders, if they hadn't exploited tribalism, Africa would be far, far advanced. Because you name anything that make countries wealthy, it's in Africa. Africa is not poor in resources. Actually, if anything, all the resources that have made other countries wealthy, they were taken from Africa. Africa is not populated by stupid, ignorant people. Uh, I see students coming to universities. I did uh, a, must, a master's degree in the UK. I did another one here. I wasn't among the most stupid students. But the problem in Africa is that those things that we have enthroned, tribalism, and we, we are proud to be Hutus, proud to be Tutsis, proud to be Tuas, in a world that is becoming a small village, Actually, I think that's one of the things we need to rise above in Africa. And we need to think about it and change it. So uh, I leave you the challenge to really think and uh, 
one way of going above that is what we are being blamed for in Rwanda, preventing people from claiming to be Hutus and Tutsis and Tuas and using that for political reasons. People say, no, 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 no. They are not allowing people in Rwanda to be Hutus. They are not allowing people to run on their ethnic cards and what. But that, that's what has destroyed Africa. And that's our big problem. You look at Kenya, very stable country. Then the tribalism came in during the elections and they destroyed the country. So I think those are some of the things we as Africans, we need to look into and simply put behind us and think constructively and more positively. And the issue of forgiveness, yes, forgiveness helps both sides. Because when you forgive, it helps your enemy, yes, but it also helps you. Because if you don't heal, then you have a problem. And I think I'm going to go in depth about that tomorrow if you want to ask the question. Um, and on the other side, you need to help the offender to deal with the guilt he carries on the heart for the things he has done. Hi, I'm Maddie Holcomb. Um, you said that you feared your generation and your parents' generation would never truly heal. How, is that something you're experiencing personally, having trouble you know, hmm? going in to forgive? What a, um, does okay. that apply to you? Can you repeat the question a bit? You said that you fear your parents' generation and your generation mm -hmm. would never truly heal. What about you? Do you feel you've truly healed and you've forgiven? I feel that I can take that If you personally. Um, when I said that, it was a matter of generalizing because I don't like when you single yourself out and say, for me, I've healed and uh, I'm not transmitting the bad neg uh, negative sentiments to my children. But for me, I've healed. Actually, that's why I started by my testimony because I grew up hating the Hutus. But um, when I came to the faith, saving faith, I healed. And that was the most uh, transformative experience in my life. And that's what I teach. Because it's possible to heal and it's possible to love even when you've been wounded. But unfortunately, it's not the case for everybody in the country. And I do understand. As one of the women was saying here, uh, She was saying, I can't forgive. And I do understand because, you know, sometimes it's difficult to forgive people who have killed your people. But if you are going to heal, you have to go through that process. But we do have a large number of people, either Hutus or Tutsis, who haven't healed from their wounds. So that's why I was saying that maybe it's going to take us one generation or two to heal and repair the country. Sarah Fry, I was wondering um, what the what part the the Tuas played in uh, this whole thing. Like, what was going on with them during the genocide and stuff? Um, the Tua, actually, if you listen to people talking about Rwanda, very often it's as if we have only two groups, but we have three. So the Tua have always been neglected and despised. So they weren't part of the mainstream of the society. So they took part in some areas, or in other areas they didn't take part, but uh, the Tours have always been outside the mainstream of the community. So actually at this moment, in the process of reconciliation, we are trying to bring them back into the mainstream of the society because they are left out by our history. 